That is our goal. And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. As we have now established in previous episodes of this series, by the end of this coming century, man must be well on his way towards colonizing the solar system. The shadow of this future prospect of the human exploration and habitation of nearby solar space casts itself on the present by forcing us today to reassess everything we thought we knew about man's existence in this universe through the lens of real-life challenges which will be posed to mankind at the moment we prepare to take our first steps onto the Martian soil. The most immediate concept which we must re-examine is a fresh definition of the term basic economic infrastructure. Infrastructure is commonly viewed today as the construction of various objects, power plants, transportation and communication systems, reservoirs and pipelines. However, to view the true meaning of infrastructure and the economic principle which it represents, we must achieve a more generalized and conceptually precise understanding of man's actual relationship to the physical universe which we inhabit. For our purposes today, let us examine this from the standpoint of the most apparent immediate problem which our cosmic pioneers will face when sailing into the vast seas of interplanetary space. Already we know, even from our limited experience with extended habitation on space stations in low Earth orbit, that astronauts tend to suffer deteriorative bone loss at a rate vastly outstripping anything previously experienced in simple osteoporosis on Earth. What is causing this deteriorative effect? At first, the answer to this question seems obvious. In a minimal gravitation environment, the body is under less stress and therefore has to work less. Therefore, isn't it obvious that the skeletal scaffolding of the body would begin to atrophy? Well, if this were the case, couldn't we just solve the problem by loading the body with more stress while in space? This method has been employed by astronauts who do rigorous exercise to try to ameliorate the effects of the mechanical unloading of bone and muscle stress due to microgravity. But even though these exercises are designed to supply plentiful stresses to their bodies, bone loss continues throughout the duration of an astronaut's stay in space. So, if the only factor determining bone strength and growth were simply load-bearing gravitational effects, why is it that when our astronauts attempt to simulate that type of activity, they still wind up with bone deterioration? This shows us that what we naively might have thought of as the relationship between our biology and the push-pull effect of gravitation now takes on a much more complex character. Even this paradox shows us that we must move beyond the simplistic notion of our terrestrial environment as one which is shaped by what we can feel, such as the downward force of gravity. If this apparent force alone doesn't account for the biological effects which we associate with the Earth-gravity terrestrial environment, what does that then tell us about unsensed principles and processes which might be acting on our bodies which we are not even aware of? Human beings have been able to extend our perception of our universe through the use of technological sense organs, instrumentation which allows us to see that space is not merely an empty void populated by discrete objects, but is an active continuum extending within and between all such seemingly separate objects, composed of an entire spectrum of radiation which we call cosmic rays, as well as various intersecting electromagnetic wave phenomena. Investigations into the relationship of electromagnetism to life goes back at least as far as the famous 18th century experiments by Luigi Galvani on the electrical stimulation of frog legs. The field of study now includes everything from the bioelectric organs used by sharks to hunt their prey, to the nature of electrical regulation of the human brain and nervous system, 
to the magnetic sense of many organisms, including certain birds famous for their ability to navigate by using the Earth's magnetic field. However, for our purposes here, one of the most compelling fields of study is the phenomenon of organic regeneration, the recreation of fully functional body parts which an organism may have lost due to injury. Comme certaines personnes le savent, et comme les plus curieuses l'auront expérimenté pendant leur enfance, la salamandre a la faculté d'abandonner sa queue si elle est attaquée. Pas d'inquiétude cependant, puisqu'elle peut régénérer sa queue ou tout autre membre amputé. L'étude des moignons de la salamandre et d'autres espèces ayant la même faculté a permis de découvrir l'existence d'un faible courant électrique à l'endroit de la plaie. Un courant électrique au comportement très caractéristique. Dans le moignon de la salamandre, le courant électrique change de direction au moment de l'amputation, passant d'une valeur quasiment nulle à une valeur positive. Peu de temps après la blessure, le courant passe de positif à très négatif. Cette inversion de polarité et cette amplification sont accompagnées par la formation d'un amas de cellules à l'extrémité du moignon, appelé blastème, un ensemble de cellules qui proviennent des tissus environnants, les os, les muscles et la peau, des cellules qui se sont dédifférenciées vers un état totipotent et à partir desquelles se formera le nouveau membre. Pendant le processus de régénération, l'amplitude de la polarisation diminue lentement jusqu'à retourner à la normale. Des expériences plus poussées ont montré que la manipulation du courant électrique interne de l'organisme peut modifier la morphologie des membres régénérés. Comme avec d'autres espèces ayant la capacité de se régénérer, le mode de formation morphologique est fonction du champ électrique. Par exemple, le planaria, une espèce de ver plat avec un système nerveux primitif, est capable de régénérer la totalité de son organisme à partir de n'importe quelle partie de lui-même. Des expériences ont montré que l'axe tête-queue du planaria est déterminé par des impulsions électriques produites par des courants internes et qu'une inversion artificielle de ce courant peut produire une tête à l'endroit où l'on aurait dû trouver une queue, et vice-versa. So, with that in mind, let's return to the subject of human bone loss in space. The most significant thing to realize is that bones, far from being mere skeletal scaffolding, are active living tissues and the only kind in humans that regenerate in a way similar to limb regeneration in a salamander. As distinct from mere wound healing, the self-repair of bone fracture in the human body is accompanied by the formation of a blastema, just as we saw in the case of the salamander. When we examine these blastemas, we find the same characteristic polarity and magnitude reversals of the electrical injury current as we found in the salamander's regenerating limbs or in the planarian. In fact, in medicine today, it has already become common practice to accelerate the healing of bone fractures through the application of pulsed electromagnetic fields. Therefore, we see that bones are living structures whose growth is regulated by electrical impulses in a way similar to what we observe in less sophisticated organisms. The discoveries which have been made concerning the relationship between regeneration and electricity give us some important clues concerning the role of electromagnetism in regulating the vital activity of the human body. We should ask, what is it about the structure of the bone that would make it respond to electric and magnetic fields?
les eaux peuvent se reformer grâce à des sollicitations mécaniques, croissant davantage dans les parties les plus sollicitées et compensant par l'élimination de matières osseuses sur d'autres parties. Ce système de croissance et de perte autorégulée est gouverné par des signaux électriques, signaux qui proviennent essentiellement de la propriété piezoélectrique des eaux, c'est-à-dire sa capacité à transformer de simples tensions mécaniques en courants électriques. L'os humain est une structure complexe, composée d'une matrice comprenant des minéraux de phosphate de calcium, liés par des fibres de collagène. On y trouve également des éléments traces, tels le cuivre. Des éléments comme le cuivre doivent jouer le rôle de fixateurs électromagnétiques qui maintiennent ensemble le collagène et l'apatite, un lien qui peut être affaibli par des perturbations du champ électrique interne du corps humain. L'ostéoporose spatiale doit résulter de la génération de courants inhabituels provoqués dans le squelette par le mouvement rapide du vaisseau à travers le champ magnétique terrestre, avec une inversion de polarité à chaque demi-orbite. Ou il peut s'agir de l'effet direct du mouvement au travers du champ magnétique lui-même. Cette anormalité qui modifie directement l'activité des cellules osseuses s'ajouterait à l'affaiblissement du système électrique osseux provoqué par la quasi-nullité de l'effet piezoélectrique en état d'apesanteur. Si cela était vrai, nous n'aurions là qu'une partie du problème. Des recherches sur l'application de champs électromagnétiques à basse fréquence sur les tissus biologiques montrent une grande variété d'effets sur l'activité cellulaire, dont les cellules impliquées dans la formation et le renouvellement des os. Il nous faut également compter avec les faibles connaissances que nous avons de l'action et de la diversité de la vie microscopique, qui est en relation symbiotique avec le corps humain dans son ensemble. Quoi qu'il en soit, il est quasiment certain que les propriétés de l'électricité et du magnétisme s'expriment différemment au sein des organismes vivants et dans les conditions habituelles des laboratoires. Par conséquent, la recherche dans l'espace, avec son environnement gravitationnel et radiatif unique, est cruciale pour les percées scientifiques qu'il est nécessaire d'accomplir dans la médecine, la biologie et la physique fondamentale. Therefore, we now see that bone loss in astronauts is not caused by simple load-bearing effects, but is a product of a much more manifold, polyphonic intersection of many different forces, minimally attributed to what we currently designate separately as electromagnetic and gravitational fields. Tracing backwards, we can imagine that the activation of these forces as through the emergence of the unique electromagnetic resonances shaped by the developing oxygen atmosphere, may have been a necessary evolutionary step in the geological history of Earth, giving rise to the appearance of the first internal skeletons following the Cambrian explosion of animal life roughly half a billion years ago. Whereas the conditions allowing the development of such skeletons represented an important advance in the capability for higher forms of animal life, to spread over land, human beings will soon be faced with the challenge of recreating appropriate conditions for the maintenance of life on other planets, as we fulfill our extraterrestrial imperative. We now see that the electromagnetic field of our planet is an integral part of our planetary infrastructure. The existence of periodically fluctuating and continually interpenetrating electromagnetic fields form an invisible part of the terrestrial environment that is as real as the oceans, mountains, and atmosphere. Big questions remain when we contemplate the challenge of how, as we leave the surface of Earth, we can take this necessary infrastructure with us. Will traveling from the Earth to Mars at one gravity-accelerated flight be enough? Or might we need to do more? How can we begin to think about providing our astronauts with the right electromagnetic and radiation diets as naturally as we think about providing them air and water? As we look at the specific electromagnetic and gravitational characteristics on Mars and other planetary bodies which we plan to settle, we have to ask ourselves, how could we possibly change these characteristics? Would we be restricted to simulating such necessary conditions locally? Or could we do it on a planet-wide scale? 
In this light, gravitation now takes on a different aspect, which includes electromagnetic and possibly other kinds of radiation. Exploring these questions of physics from the standpoint of the relationship of the biology of living organisms to electromagnetic radiation and gravitational fields may help to actually redefine our naive notions of gravity and the electromagnetic spectrum itself. What are the functional relationships between these supposedly different field phenomena? How can we, as man, become master over these forces and begin to manufacture them as needed? Such radiations permeate the solar system, but must be sculpted by us as co-creators to support the spread of life in general, and human life in particular, to the farthest reaches of the cosmos. This is the radically new, true notion of infrastructure, or what would be better termed as physical economic platforms. Man's creation of the synthetic environments necessary for the survival of our species and for the further development of our universe, a notion which must shape the way we think about economics, even here on Earth, today.